Welcome everyone for our second day of uh, webinars, uh, making part of our celebration week at Music and also College of Agriculture. So it's very nice to be here again with you to make this second day of webinars. So uh, our dean, our direction, and our colleagues at the Zauki, we decide to explore the thematic bio issues, bio insumes, bio products in agriculture. So how to use biological products in agriculture. And this is uh, going to be a whole week discussion in our uh, campus. So we started yesterday with an event in Portuguese for a broad audience. And today we start our webinars and make, prepare it together with our A5 colleagues. So for people that are not, not used to the term, the A5 means that we are an, an alliance with the five most important college of agriculture worldwide. So it's always part of that. It's very nice to be part of that with people from Wagner University in the Netherlands, the UC Davis in the US, the Cornell University, Cornell, and also Cal, the Chinese Agricultural University. So all these uh, five universities, they dedicated time, they elected some names to be together to join this week in uh, specific discussions. Uh, this, this will be the first day of these events. So it's nice to present you. Uh, the, the team that you have today for this discussion. So the, the thematics uh, that we elected for today is biological resources improving crop efficiency. So it's a very broad theme. So you will be that each colleague uh, will work in different distinct uh, thematic issues, different points. So you are going to put this together in a nice discussion and it's fully open for contribution. So send us our, uh, your questions to the system that you are watching this uh, event. Uh, I will present the three colleagues that I have today to, to, to this event. And the first one will be Dr. Martin Van Interson. He is a professor in plant production system at Wagner University. So, uh, Martin, very nice to have you here. So, I studied in Wagner for one and a half years in total, almost. It was a great time of my life. Always nice to, to see people from Ruhr connect with us. Uh, Dr. Martin will talk about sustainable intensification and circularity agricultural production. Uh, so I'm willing to see your presentation. And then uh, I want to invite doc Dr. Lixing Wan, who is a professor in plant nutrition at China Agriculture University. He is focused on improvement of crop and nutrient use efficiency using physiology, genet genetics, and molecular approaches. So today he will talk a little bit about his work on integrated approach to improve crop and nutrient use efficiency in China. A very broad term, so it's a real challenge, but very, very much important for our discussion today. And the third colleague I want to invite is an alumni of our school. So it's very nice to have, have you here, Dr. George Rodriguez, a professor at UC Davis. So uh, he's a former student of our campus. He did a graduation at Zalki. And now he's a professor at the Department of Land, Air, and Water Resources at the University of California in Davis. And he's also a soil microbiologist uh, interested in uh, land use change and agricultural soil health initiatives. He'll talk about soil plant human health connections. A very nice thematic to, to join this discussion. And it'll be the last one to, sh to show some slides, to say some words. I try to to, to explore the thematic integrity of microbiology in modern agriculture. So you see that you are going to build a nice story. I hope you will, we can uh, do this uh, attempt in the right time because we don't have like the full day to talk about it. They are, the, the issues are important, the subjects are very broad. So it's challenging to summarize it, but I know you, you can do uh, your best. Uh, so after this uh, initial words, the opening, uh, uh, I think it's time to make the presentations. Uh, after that, you have time for discussions. And then I will invite the first speaker, the first uh, colleague to, to talk, Dr. Martin Van Interson. Uh, we're planning to have a 10 to 7, uh, 7 to 10 minutes each one to present our words, our slides, and then we'll go to discussion. Dr. Martin, again, thank you for your acceptance to be here and your dedication to prepare the presentations. And uh, feel free, you have the floor. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fernando. Can you see my screen? Yes, I think. Uh. So I hope you can all hear me. 
Um, I would like to introduce, um, is that correct, Fernando? You can all hear me? Yeah, it's perfect. If you have some problem, I will say something. Don't worry about it. Good. Please Good. do so. Um, I can't see you, but um, it's nice to uh, interact with you, uh, and I hope I can address some of your questions later on. First, I would like to uh, introduce uh, two principles, which I think are highly related to the topic of today, biological resources improving crop efficiency. That's our topic. And I would like to introduce two principles, circularity and diversity. Um, but before doing so, I think it's extremely important to, to recognize, to acknowledge that in different parts of the world, priorities can differ a lot. And I'm speaking mostly today, I think, from the perspective of Europe, and that could also be the United States, could partly be countries like Brazil or Australia. But I'm certainly not so much speaking from the perspective of Africa, for instance, where an increase in production is really the top priority to keep up with population growth and with dietary change. But I think a continent like Europe can and should play a leading role in developing cleaner, more sustainable, and uh, today I will introduce more circular food systems. So I will focus on that, that the priority for, for Europe and for uh, other parts of the world which are have more or less similar priorities. Um, why is that important? Because uh, our uh, food system is playing a major role in environmental issues. It's taking close to 40% of the uh, total land use. It's taking about a third of the acidification. It's, um, it's responsible for close to 80% of eutrophication. Uh, and you can see the other environmental issues. Um, in this graph, the, the darker part, dark green part, is the share of uh, animal sourced food. Uh, and the uh, lighter green color is the rest of, of the food, so the plant uh, based products. And you can see that animals play a very important role in our environmental problems. Now, to address that, I think it's very much needed to take a, a food systems approach rather than just a rather narrow crop focus, a crop production focus. I think we should look at the entire food system. That means we have to include the consumption, which is part of the uh, equation. And then next, we, and, and the consumption, it means what human beings eat. And um, the next thing we have to consider is all the biomass that is being produced on, uh, on arable land, on grassland, and also in natural waters, because that's the basis of our food. The production chain, the, the processing is important. And then, of course, all around the livestock sector, including fisheries, what comes from water. So if we take that broader perspective, we can talk about what circularity implies and what it should Im imply. I did that together with my colleague uh, from uh, Animal Production Systems, uh, Professor Imke de Boer, um, uh, two years back, and we wrote uh, um, this booklet about principles for circularity in agriculture production. And we identified three main principles. And I think they will help to um, make better use of our biological resources for crops as well. The first one is that plant biomass is the basis of everything. And we should produce and use it primarily to um, feed human beings directly and not to feed animals. So use our good agriculture land to produce human food and not feed. That's the first principle that leads to the highest resource efficiency of our land. The second principle is that we should avoid waste where possible, um, but sometimes um, byproducts and, and some waste will be unavoidable. And then we have to reuse all the byproducts in the entire food system with the right priorities. I'll come back to that in a minute. And the third principle is that, yes, we can have animals in our food system, um, probably much less than today, at least for Europe and, and other parts of the world. Um, but let's um, use animals in the food system for what they are good at, and that is upgrading low opportunity uh, cost feed including grass, but also all sorts of byproducts that come with the food system and that we as humans cannot consume directly. Straw and, and uh, um, uh, other things that come with processing of, uh, of our products. 
Now, what are the implications of these three principles? Very quickly, because you can easily fill a lecture with that, but um, these principles imply that we should use our good soils to produce biomass for human consumption and not for feed. That's what I already said. Uh, while currently about 40% of our cropland is used to produce fee feed, which, which could also be consumed directly by human beings, eh? for instance, maize or uh, wheat or, or barley or whatever. Um, secondly, the, um, we must avoid waste, um, but sometimes this is not possible. And certainly the byproducts uh, we cannot uh, avoid in many cases. Um, and the pulp uh, that comes with sugar extraction or with uh, soybean uh, uh, processing. And in those cases, we have to reuse all byproducts with a good priority. And that includes the byproducts of human beings that uh, end up in cities. The, our excreta and our waste products that accumulate and that, that are basically disposed um, in or near the cities. Recycle, reuse all these products with a good priority. First of all, I think to maintain our soils because that is the basis of our food production. And that means um, maintaining a good soil organic matter content. Um, good is good enough. I, I'm not uh, making a plea here for um, uh, carbon sequestration as a purpose in itself. I'm just um, uh, stressing this issue to, to maintain the soil quality, uh, which requires a certain level of soil organic matter. The second priority um, is to, to fertilize our land, um, and that implies the cycling of nitrogen and phosphorus um, in our food system. So to reuse all the byproducts and the nutrients that are in these byproducts for the sake of fertilization. And that is then the first um, part of our fertilization, and it can be complemented. Uh, so on top of these organic sources, it can be complemented with the mineral fertilizers, but not the other way around. And then the, uh, the other um, purpose of byproducts can be to use it as feed for livestock because livestock has the beautiful capacity to upgrade low opportunity um, products, byproducts that we as humans cannot consume directly to beautiful food and other products which are very useful for humans. That will inevitably lead to a new balance between consumption and production a lower amount of animal proteins available for human consumption. But still, there will be human, uh, there will be animal proteins available. Um, so a new balance between consumption and production. That is the, the circular, circularity principles applied to food systems. But I would like to add one more principle, and that is diversity. And that's my final slide. I think we have to cherish diversity in our food system because that can help to um, particularly to, uh, of course, to bring in nitrogen into the system through legumes, but it can also help to uh, suppress, to some extent, pests and diseases, and it can help to uh, maintain or, in, in some cases, increase biodiversity. Diversity can mean different things in the top left corner, um, different uh, crop cultivars of the same crop in one field. This is a potato field with two um, um, cultivars. It could be several of them. Um, in the top right, you see intercropping, wheat and maize. And nowadays, we also have strip cropping as a new uh, um, management uh, way of managing uh, crops with multiple um, crops with small strips of three to six meters in one field. Um, these are, say, spatial configurations of diversity. But in the bottom left corner, you see crop rotation, an example of crop rotation. So the the diversity in time, the sequence of crops in time on one field, and then finally in the, in the bottom right corner, um, diversity at the landscape level. So the right crops and grassland, if you want, uh, on the right soils, but also um, with a right, um, with proper spread across the landscape to um, um, serve uh, different ecosystems. I think if we uh, endorse these two principles, circularity, and um, diversity, of, we have a good starting point to address the issue of biological resources to improve our crop efficiency. And I look forward to discuss this in more detail um, uh, after the three presentations. And for now, I thank you for your attention.
Very nice, very nice, Dr. Martin. I think your your subject is important, and in the end, just come to the same point. I think all of us will will, will go. Uh, in the end, you need to be responsible with the soils you have to produce food or whatever, and to see how to use the products we extract from the soil. That's the main message I got from your talk. And uh, this conservation system is uh, the only way you have to to keep feeding the world. Well, that's the, that's the way it is. Uh, so thank you. We'll come uh, come come up a few later with our discussions. Uh, but to keep on time, I want to invite Dr. Lixin to join us, and then uh, we'll see his presentation because I think he's going to be very complementary to the talk you did. Uh, he's going to show the, the challenge, the opportunities in a big country, big country with great areas for cultivation. So we know that the, the challenges are different. Just wait for, yeah. Here we have Dr. Lixing. Thank you very much for joining us uh, at night in China. So we know it, uh, you, you did a good uh, strike, an important sacrifice to be here. So. Uh, we thank you very much for that and are willing to see your presentation. Just uh, take the stage. Okay, can you hear me? Perfect, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so I'm now starting to share my screen. Can you, can you see that? I will help you on that. I can see your presentation. It's perfect. All right. Okay, okay, now I start. Okay, thank you very much for the chairman. So it's my great pleasure to join this uh, webinar. Uh, today I will talk about an uh, integrated approach to improve crop nutrient use efficiency in China. So as Martin said, so his topic is, is general for the global and my topic will concentrate on the problems and our uh, uh, solution in China. So I'm very happy to include uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Fu So Zhang. He is a great people who are working on this area and make uh, a great achievement. So uh, the, I will start with three topics, the challenges in China and our strategy and the progress and uh, uh, our future, what we can do and how we can do. So, uh, for China, it took us several hundred years to realize the dream of the food, the enough food. So, you know, it's, it's, the, it's hunger is it's really a great problem in, in old China since until uh, even at, uh, at the end of the last century, we're still struggling for this. But nowadays, our Green production is already more than the green demand. So it's at this point. So it's a good sign, but we are still need to work on that to maintain the green increment with the, uh, the population increment. However, with the large increase of the green production, we consume the large amount of fertilizer in China as you can illustrate, uh, can see from this figure, that actually our green production increased about three fold or three times. However, we consumed 25 uh, times or fold the chemical fertilizer. It means we are not really efficient. So as a consequence, the overuse the fertilizer, in particularly nitrogen fertilizer, that, that really damaged our environment in China like water pollution, more in the nutrition by nitrogen and phosphorylation, and acidified the, the our crop plant, mainly by overuse of nitrogen fertilizer, mainly ammonium-based uh, nitrogen fertilizer. And also the nitrogen deposition is also great. For example, the, the increase almost twice in the last 20 years. So in this case, China is faced the situation. From one side, we would like to improve the nitrogen, uh, improve the crop productivity, but we would like to really find the point we can 
really use less resource and also maintain the environmental sustainability. So the green part is our point. We would like to can we like to balance the 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 food uh, security, resource security, and the environment protection. So the strategy one, which has been already intense views in China, is we breed the nutrient efficient crops. So for example, this is the nutrient use efficient crops in China. For example, uh, maize, the, the yield and the nutrient efficiency increase dramatically. For example, uh, our colleagues did a nice calculation to compare the old cativas, which released before the 2000, and the new cativas, which released after 2000. Then the yield increased, and in particular, the nitrogen use efficiency are also increased, and the, the nitrogen emission somehow decreased. So it's a good sign. We can use uh, the smart crop cativas to reduce the nitrogen uh, uh, leaching into the environment or nitrogen loss to the environment. The second strategy is we try to build up integrated soil crop systems to maintain or to realize the crop yield and high nutrient use efficiency simultaneously. This is also nice group, uh, nice work from a group of Fuso Zhang that did a uh, very good uh, cropping systems in, 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 uh, in parallel with the soil management and nutrient management. Then they realized the yield and the nutrient efficiency at the same time. And this is a, the nice case. In, in this is a nice this is a nice case for for the maize. And this can be also done now in, in other crops like uh, uh, rice and the wheat. So uh, this is also a nice paper in, in Nature uh, 2014. Then uh, by the group, hard work from the group, you can really realize the high yield, which produce more uh, with lower in environmental cost. So the strategy three is how to empower the, the small hold farmers to realize these nice goals. This is also a great challenge. In China, we, we have millions of, of farmers that really had very low uh, feed area. So it's very hard to, to, to work with them to, to realize the nutrient use efficiency. So this is also the nice case which has been published by Fu Zhang in 2018. So with the strategies, collaborate with the scientists and uh, extension surveys, and also the uh, agro-business uh, apartment, then we can really do a great job with uh, small hold farmers and uh, uh, to benefit from these uh, systems. So uh, in the future, we start raising on one side, we would like to exploring the potentials for integrate, integrated the breeding and the management strategies to maximize the crop nutrient use efficiency. One side is the genotypes and also the optimal management, then to fit the environment to realize the high yield, lower resource, and the lower environment cost. On the other hand, also as Martin already mentioned, we have to really think about the system approach for the uh, future agriculture systems. We call it uh, agriculture green development. We, we need green production and integrate plant animal production. And also we should think about the consumers to make green products and also for green industry. Finally, we can achieve access to a green environment. So in the total, we can, uh, uh, we can have uh, ensure the food security, resource efficiency, environment sustainability, ecosystem service, human health, and also uh, increase the farmer income. So that's all, all, all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be very happy to answer any questions or we can discuss later after all the speakers finished. Thank you. All right, Dr. Lixing, thank you very much for your presentation. 
I think you, I think you put another subject on the table because uh, Dr. Martin talked about uh, the reverse circularity and responsibility to use soil and put efficiency on that. It's very important to join all these concepts. And I think they are not like uh, one to another, like not an opposite side. They go together if you know how to manage systems. That's the idea you're trying to build here. So you put there and for discussions for all of mem all members. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, you come by. You come back uh, in a few minutes for our discussion. And now I want to ask uh, our uh, our colleague jo George Rodriguez to join us. Uh, George, as I said, a professor at UC Davis. And he's going to put another important topic on the table about the connections of soil health and human health. I think it's a very timing subject and uh, we need to see your presentation. George, I have to say uh, you are in your home now. <laughs> Not Thank in your you. home, in your house, in your home at the South. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, let's see if you can, can you see my presentation now? Yeah, I think okay. so. All right. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for this opportunity. I had one, I have wonderful members of my time in Piracicaba, so I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, what I'm going to try to do today is to give you a little bit of a short overview of how we're studying biological inputs into soil systems. I took this picture some time ago here in California, close to my home, and I was thinking, that there's nothing that makes people happier than seeing a field full of sunflowers. Uh, in, in, in fact, medical doctors, they have said in the past that uh, uh, there is a strong connection between you feeling happy and being healthy. So as a soil microbiologist, I start asking the question, uh, how can I uh, uh, ask a soil if the soil is happy or if a soil is healthy? So in order for me to, to ask this question, I have to revisit the idea of what's human health. And here's one of the definitions for you. Uh, but there are two points in this definition that are important. There are many, many different definitions. But this one, there's two words. One is the idea of being relative. So it's a relative state. Today I'm healthy. The next day I catch COVID-19 and I'm sick. Uh, and the other one is the idea of environment. So in order for you, the, so the environment that surrounds you uh, and makes you feel function well, your mind, uh, your psychology, your relationships with others, your sociological health, and then your physiology, your biological health. Now, if we use this definition of human health, how can we translate that into uh, soil health? So how can we bridge this idea of human and soil health? We soil microbiologists and soil scientists, in general, we're pretty good in explaining uh, or identifying chemical properties and physical properties associated with, with soil. I can say, you know, the pH is such and such, or the nutrient level is such and such, and that makes it a good soil for me to grow my crops. Uh, but we have very limited information about the biological properties of soil. We basically say, oh, there are too many microbes there, and then uh, there's not much more we can do. Uh, so, uh, and that's what we wanted to change. We should start paying attention to that in order to develop a soil that's healthy. Uh, I cannot, because I cannot ask the soil if the soil is happy uh, or, or healthy, what I can do is to measure stress level. So you and me, when we are stressed, uh, uh, our health status decline. And what happens to you is that you change your hormonal levels. There's some hormones that will change the concentration uh, uh, and then they'll increase or decrease. The same thing will happen for microbes, not with hormones. What microbes will do is to use transcriptional factors or sigma factors or genes that regulates other genes. So today what I'm going to give you is a small example of the, the, the work that we have been doing with two of those genes. One is the for one for carbon starvation, uh, and this is the RPOS. The RPOS, uh, it becomes, this gene becomes activated and it turns off 300, more than 300 other genes. It's basically telling the cell, uh, don't grow because there's no carbon outside. How we can learn from this information 
in, in, in with regards to carbon in soil. Carbon is such an important uh, component of soil systems. And the other one is uh, it's regarding to heat stress. I learned today that the temperature in Piracicaba is 96 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, so it's, uh, I, uh, it's really, really hot today. So uh, probably some of the microbes in the soils in Piracicaba are some in some kind of heat stress at this point. So I'm going to touch base on that. The heat stress one is this, this gene that uh, what helps is to fold the proteins uh, inside of the inside of the cell. Now, because uh, from the previous work that we have done in the Amazon forest for quite some time, and I put and I apologize for putting a long list of publications here, but what I wanted to do is to prove to you that there are no doubts right now the microbial communities, microbes in soil, they are suffering from the consequence of forest destruction. Uh, and there are changes that happen. Uh, so here's an example for you of a forest and the pasture, and, and there's a big blob of uh, DNA that's missing from the pasture sample because uh, the microbes are gone. But we also learn from the same work uh, that the pastures, uh, have a much higher carbon concentration in soils. This means that in the forest, most of the carbon is above ground, are like trees and leaves, uh, but there, both, most of the carbon in the forest soil, it's hard carbon, difficult carbon for to be processed by the microbes and then lower concentration. In the pasture samples, because there is grass, you have a, a much larger carbon output. Now, what can we learn from this information that was done in the Amazon and use in agricultural fields here in California? So uh, we did this. We tested the idea of the RPOS and the RPOE, and, and this is metagenomes. Uh, these are uh, total DNA that was sequenced from those two uh, from two environments, and you can see that the RPOS, the one related to the carbon we have a much higher number of those genes present in the forest sample in comparison to the pasture. It's basically saying that the microbes in the forest are starving for carbon. So those genes are, are much higher uh, in, in numbers there. The other way around goes for the RPOE. The RPOE, I told you, it's related to stress of temperature. And this gene is significantly higher in, 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 uh, in the pasture samples. If you go to the Amazon and you measure the temperature of the uh, pasture soil, it will be three to five uh, degrees centigrade higher than in the forest. So you can have information about the stress level of this organism. Again, how can we translate this to uh, uh, California? Well, here in the UC Davis, we have the Century Experiment. And the Century Experiment is an experiment that's going on for a hundred years. Uh, uh, and then we have different inputs. We have conventional versus uh, uh, manure compost and reduced tillage of that uh, uh, environment. So we tested, but done from the plant side, not from the microbes. The microbes, we knew that they responded the same way they responded in the Amazon. But what happens to the plants? So we had tomatoes. In, in those tomatoes, uh, when we measured the hormonal levels in tomatoes, uh, we see that uh, jasmonic acid, one of the uh, or hormones associated with uh, uh, resistance to diseases, is much higher in the organic system. So it's basically telling us that the conventional system, the plants are way more stressed than it would be uh, in the organic system. Mainly the conventional system, uh, the plants look a little uh, 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 a little more beautiful because they're greener, but in some way they are not as healthy as you think. Now, uh, the next question for us is, well, well, what is the connection of this with human health, right? Uh, well, we don't have a connection yet, but we know for sure from our preliminary results that organic inputs increase nutrient levels, uh, at least for, for our tomatoes increase the micronutrient concentration, increase the vitamin levels. So I'm not saying here that we should convert everything into organic production. That's not what I'm saying. 
But what I'm saying is that we need to start considering the incorporation of, of management practices that will recycle uh, all the organic material that we have been generated in order to make a production system that is healthy for the soil, is healthy for the plant, and is healthy for the humans who are consuming that. So this is line. What we have been using is machine learning algorithms here in California, and, and, and we are showing some of the factors that are associated uh, with the fruit yield of the tomato. And you can note here that organic matter is an important one, as it is in organic nitrogen and phosphorus, as some of the other speakers uh, mentioned as well, in order to have a, 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 a production. We also have been using the same algorithms uh, uh, in machine learning to understand what will be the genes that you can use as indicators of soil health uh, in a system. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, that is all I have to say. Uh, I have to, to make an announcement here. We're putting together a, a, a book for kids. Uh, we want to educate kids in science and agriculture. And the guy with a token that you see here, uh, 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 with a microscope in the field. I don't know how the, the, the person did this. Uh, it's me, so uh, it's, a, it's a book that we're uh, releasing for, for kids to educate them in, uh, about science. Thank you very much. Very nice talk, George. Thank you very much. Ah, so now I have a lot of things to, to put together. Very nice to see the connections and to see the tools you are developing to measure these things. It's really challenging to, to measure systems. Yeah, normally you do it by yields, by whatever soil quality, but soil quality itself is a very challenging sub, uh, subject to measure. So we're going to discuss everything in a minute. I'll just use now myself five minutes to, to give some words for you about the concept that I think is going to, to mix all these concepts. I think it's going to link together the, the subjects. Okay, thank you. I'll see you in a minute. Uh, my time to share my screen. I hope it works perfectly. Ooh, in a minute. Do you have a problem now? Yeah. Yeah. Now, yes. Let's see. Share screen. Uh, I think you are now all of you can see my presentation. Yeah. Okay, uh, the idea here is to present you a little bit of the work we develop uh, in our soil science department at the Zalki. What you do here is try to put in a table uh, new tools, new ideas, new theory about soil microbiology in a way that you can manage soil better. Because as George said, the other colleagues also agree, we can measure our chemical properties much better than soil, than biological part of the soil. Not because we didn't do it, because we are learning how to measure soil biology now. And the important question that... Okay, I just got a message that you have a problem to see the presentations. Yeah? Yes. I think like this is better. All right, I will keep like this. It's better to guarantee the quality. Uh, the main question that you have to answer is how do you make plants that will permeate other discussions? And you have uh, several tools to make plants involving different components of the management. You have worry wild, like nutritional aspects of plant, climate, stress and protections, whatever. And you have also biological resources that can use, apply and improve the use of these resources in modern agriculture. So what you try to do is to see how the connections between the microbiological resources occur with other components of the management. So if you use better the biological resources, if you use better the concepts of microbiology and biological part of the system, not only soil, but the interface soil plant, I think you have opportunity to improve the nutritional aspect of plants. We can make plants much, much more resilient to uh, climate changes, to climate stress. We can protect plant, plants better. We can uh, in harness like the genetic potential of plants. We can easily facilitate mechanization because it has a very strong connection with soil uh, quality. Uh, the idea is that the living soil is made of uh, uh, the, the called microbiome. 
the idea is that part of the soil is made of living organisms that you call the soil microbiome, a very complex system made of several species, different sizes, different metabolisms, in a way that you have a, a web of biological activity in the soil. That's the most part difficult of the soil to measure because it's very difficult to see what kind of microbes you have there. It's not only a, a microscope visualization leading to genetic information, as George just presented you. We need the uh, knowledge about indicators of soil quality, considering the biological part. So we're dealing with thousands of different species living in a single gram of soil. So in a single gram of soil, having millions of organisms uh, uh, encompassed in different species. So targeting this uh, soil microbiome is very challenging, very active in agriculture. And I guess it's very important to target the soil microbiome because it has several important questions related to soil quality. It's very involved, very much involved in nutrient cycling. Once that microbes can access part of nutritional uh, nutrients in soil that plants are not able to do alone. So uh, microbes can solubilize phosphorus, can fix nitrogen, whatever. All the, the, the features that plants are not uh, able to do. Uh, the soil activity is linked to structure of soil, formation of aggregates. It means that it has a balance between oxygen and water in the soil that's very dependent on soil activity. It depends very much on soil for soil formation, for soil quality, and how soil serves for plant development. And they will also see several connections between plants and microbes. So plants will use the biological resources in soil, mainly in the rhizosphere, that we're not going to target this issue today, but the rhizosphere is a way that plants can connect to soil biology. We're using this for protection, using this for plant growth promotion. It means that plants and microbes has a long story of evolution. So they are complementary metabolically. They know how to talk to each other and they take advantage uh, both. Plants use microbes for their benefits and microbes use plant resource for their interactivity in soil. So understanding better the central point here, understanding better the central uh, position of soil microbiome can make us more successful to explore the soil as uh, an entire entity where plants develop and plants present its potential for our productions. Uh, but what happens uh, is that uh, George just showed you that, that, and I'm using the term that uh, we see in the literature, it happens that in the under agricultural system, normally the soil microbiome is depleted. It means that when you transform the soil, you lose uh, the biological quality of soil. Because you have in agricultural fields, different composition of soils as it was for the millions of years before it was used for agriculture. When you look to the agricultural soil, you have a different pH, you have a different diet of organic matter, so you see that different organisms are not feeding like in the same way they did for the last thousand years in the native soils. It means that when you deplete the soil microbiology, you lose functions in the system. Losing functions in the system means that the, the biodiversity, the biological part of the soil is under its potential in most of agricultural soil. So technically, uh, you uh, are considering this, this aspect, it means that you can use better soil biology, so in a way that you get more advantage of this uh, uh, present system that every soil has. How do you manage biological part of the soil? How do you do uh, biological management of soils, or how do you use different management that touch soil biology, making it more functional, more equilibrated, more active in the agricultural systems? It's a fully open question. If it permeates other talks, we can see in other talks how the importance is the use of diversity, the use of uh, organic amendments and whatever. But I try to uh, summarize the opportunity we have to make the soil biological management in this slide. Uh, here I have, we have again the same terms that was used by Dr. Martin, like crop rotation, the intercrop cultivation, integration of systems, how to make the the systems more circular, more made based on diversity. We have also uh, new technologies der deriving from different uh, aspects of the management, like fertilization technology, the organic minerals, organic residues, as George just talked about it. The pesticide technology, of course, it's very important interaction between you know, uh, chemical molecules in the soil with this living system. And you have also the biological products, like, well, of course, you have science been doing in this area, you have technology being developed in this area. So you have a plenty of uh, different bi biological products in the market that are there to harness, to empower in the, the biological systems of the soil. So the idea is that you use all these possibilities to make a system that is more uh, comfortable for microbes to perform, to do the functions we expect then, and then plants will better develop in the system. 
Uh, just to mention, I think the biological marketing in agriculture is a very important area. Yesterday, we had a great discussion about that, so people can see the talk of yesterday. It's important, but it's available. And uh, the biological part of the mar uh, marketing in agriculture is being the growing different areas. We have inoculants for plants, uh, nutritional supply, we have biodefensives. That will be a subject for the, the webinar on Thursday. We have also biological conditioners of soil that have different ways of action. So we have a plenty of different products that can help us to give soils a better situation concerning its biological activity, biological composition, and a better use of soil microbiome in agriculture. And my final slide, I think, is only to say uh, the, the phrase you try to work on. So my group at the South USP will work to prove it and to give you more data on this kind of uh, affirmation. It says associations between plants and microbes can buffer the agricultural systems, protecting it against stress and making it less dependent of artificial supply of plant elements. It means that working on soil microbiology is preparing a soil as a more comfortable systems where plants can grow and can produce better so you can get more yield and more sustainability. With that, I want to thank you for the, 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 the your attention. Uh, and I think I have to join my colleagues, so I have a different uh, points for the, to discuss at this moment. Uh, maybe I can ask the, 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 our support to put our colleague, colleagues in the, in, the, in the screen now. I think it was not arranged. We know the subject of each one was going to talk, but we didn't see the presentation, we didn't see uh, exactly what was going to be said. And I think it was very nice. We we'll have a great story now to, to discuss. Uh, if you agree, I will keep it open. If you want to say or comment something, just uh, get your microphone and start saying. I think everyone has time to do that, you have plenty of time. And uh, we, we elected some uh, some thematics for the discussion, some issues to, dis to discuss. And the first one, I think, that will permeate all the, the talks is agriculture efficiency. How do we put together yield and sustainability? So I need a candidate now to start. <laughs> I can start with two words and then you, you go on. Most of people that when they don't know about the agricultural system, they don't know about the production system, they think that you have to choose or choose yield or you choose sustainability. Do you think it's true? Or you can put these two words together, like yield is a factor of sustainability. Can you allow worldwide today with the size of agricultural land that we have, that we expect to not to op open new areas. Can you allow areas with low yield? It's feasible, it's uh, sustainable to keep soil like this. Yeah, I, Dr. Yeah. Martin. Um, I think it's inevitable that there is some, what we call trade-off between uh, feeding billions of people and uh, what is uh, best for our environment and for our biodiversity. Um, I mean, we have we have surpassed a number of people on our planet that uh, that that um, there is no trade off between the two, I believe. Um, so and it will become increasingly challenging if, if our population increases to nine or 10 billion, particularly if uh, we are not going to change our consumption, at least uh, in in say the, the industrialized countries our high level of animal protein consumption so i i do believe there is some uh, unavoidable trade-off of course the challenge is to to minimize that trade-off to balance the two ob objectives as good as possible uh, and to produce enough uh, at acceptable um, um, uh, levels of impact on on the environment and, and use of natural resources so that would be my first uh, response to your question So, Fernando, I would like to ask, uh, or I would like to maybe add one sentence. So, in particularly in China, I think the, the yield, or the high yield, is, is part of sustainability, as far as I, I, I think, yeah. So, uh, of course, we, we can, maybe we can use a nice way to, to, to think about the environment 
if we sacrifice the yield, but this cannot be sustainable, in particularly in developing country. So since we have a large population, we, we have high demand of the food. So, and technically, or from the science and the technology, it, it's possible to, to synchronize or to, to, to realize the high yield and the uh, uh, environment, a uh, low environment cost. Uh, it's possible to, to, to realize simultaneously. So I, I think the, the sustainable, sustainability includes the high yield environment, human health, and, and many, many aspects. Okay. That's how I say I see the same thing. I, I see uh, yield as an important uh, component of our formula, because uh, of course it depends out very much on the size of property, size of the country, demand for food that you have. But I think like uh, in Brazil, we have now in Brazil eighty, almost eighty million hectares of uh, arable land or cultivable land. Don't use uh, arable land anymore. No. Cultivated area, more or less. A general number and have a double of this area in uh, pastures so we don't have to think or consider opening new areas because we have a lot of environmental concerns you have to preserve that but you can convert pasture areas to agricultural areas so that's the challenge and this challenge only makes sense if the people involved in this activity they get some money no one's going to do, to use like biological products to produce less it means you are losing economical efficiency, like economical viability. Of course, it's a complex thematics, but when you think like this, you have to, to consider that if you don't have yields, sustainability is very difficult to be achieved because people are going to use more areas in a less efficient way. I think these two things are together, and they think biological properties of the soil, biological properties of the plant, and how they connect to each other, they are mandatory to join these two concepts. Because all, all this circularity or this complementarity or this biodiversity in the system is very much represented by the li life in the soil that's not only the plant, the other components of this is that make all this 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 uh, engine works, how they, they connect to each other, they make a complementary uh, function. How do you see that in, in your studies, George? Because I know have a great story about the, the comparison between forest and pastures, forest and the agricultural area. How do you see this change in the, the complementarity of the system? So, so, so for us here, I, I'm trying to use the information that we gain from uh, changing uh, land use that goes from a natural system to a, a, a change system like pasture but we're trying to apply this to California fields. fields. Uh, part of my responsibility as professor here is to help California agriculture. So we here in California, we have developed a program that is called uh, the Soils Health Program. And it's not like the, as you said, it's not like the government is giving money to the farmers to have more inputs, organic inputs into, into their soils, but it's a way for the farmers to connect with the university, uh, with researchers doing research related to, to soil health. And then together they can devise programs that, let's say that you are a farmer working on, on a, you, you have a dairy farm. Well, you have a dairy farm, you produce a lot of manure. If you produce a lot of manure, uh, uh, there are two options, or you spray this manure back into soil or you make those big lagoons that will be release a lot of methane. So you don't want that to happen. So it's better to have, or you can have a, a like like in 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 uh, the Netherlands, they have anaerobic digesters, which is a great way for you to generate energy and you still uh, 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 make some money on the side. So we we're trying to do that here in, in California, and I think that is a way for us to to break the cycle of just exploiting the soil and, and not make it sustainable for future generations. So, Very nice. Dr. Martin, want to say something? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with those uh, with what you said, but I would like to add that I think we should also consider to, to um, establish, re-establish a certain balance between livestock and, and, and plant production. So 
the weather is really a misbalance at, at, at a, a certain regional scale, um, then I think, um, I mean, the Netherlands is an example, we run into problems. And, and of course, we can start to process the manure then, as, as we're doing with anaerobic digestion or other technologies. Um, but I think still from, an, from a sustainability perspective, we first import the feed, and then we, we uh, use a lot of energy to process the manure. And then what do we do with the processed manure? That's another question. So I think uh, that there is some unbalance in the system there that we need to re-establish. And uh, a good mix of, of uh, uh, plant and animal production at a landscape level is probably a good condition to to better score in terms of environmental and sustainability. There is important. It's easy. All right. There is an I said, I, I finished by saying it's easier said than done. As, ah, we, uh, as we as we are um, uh, experiencing in the Netherlands, uh, for instance, it's always like this: like uh, uh, the doing is much uh, has much more uh, components to the, to the decision points. But there is a question that goes in line with this first one: that's how do we measure this kind of efficiency? Like, how do we measure circularity? How do we measure crop efficiency? How do we measure biological part of the soil. George just showed some uh, some tools that we have now, like genetic tools. We know that in science you do it, it's very nice. How, how do you measure? And I would like to put you another point that is even more important to uh, consider the audience you have. How do we measure and show for people involved in the activity if they are doing right or not the process? It's open for uh, ideas. So, so uh, so I, I can answer for myself uh, from this side. I don't know what the right tools at this point for us to measure properly the efficiency of our agricultural systems. I think we're still trying to uh, uh, trying to understand what it is, specifically from the biological point of view. Uh, we have, as I showed you, we have some metrics there that chemistry and physics, uh, but not much of any other. Uh, biological systems. Uh, so I think at the, at the end, what's going to happen is that we're going to be able to identify some markers. And I'm not, in, I'm not talking about only genetic or biological markers. I'm talking about physical markers, like very simple things like aggregate formation in soil as a way for you to establish if this soil is, it's, it's, it's uh, is structured well. It's 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 it prevents erosion and, and things like that. Uh, from the other side, as as Martin pointed out, it's the diversity of the system. So how are you uh, uh, doing rotation systems that increase the diversity of the the microbial communities or the communities of soil, the the nutrients that we're recycling in soil? So uh, it's a little bit more complex than just identify a single. Uh, uh, a metric, uh, but I think it's possible. If we got to the, if, if, we, if we now have buildings and, and airplanes, I think we can, you know, uh, uh, go back to soil and, and, and re redesign the way we uh, utilize soil systems. It's very challenging. I know, I know. I, I, what I have is the feeling that the idea, the concept is already permeating, at least in Brazil, I know a little bit. Uh, is permeating the the, 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 production, the producers, the farmers. They know that uh, uh, sustaining the system is important, it's only not only extracting the, the crops. So that's the idea. They have, they have the feeling, but they need and they want tools to measure it. Uh, maybe, Martin, do you have any idea how to measure circularity on the system? Well, I mean, that's not a trivial question, but I, I think it's always important to consider um, environmental course economic criteria because the farmers need to survive I mean that's so I fully agree with Lick Singh that um, we, we need to consider the economics but if we focus on the environment um, I think we should always um, have a look at, at emissions or environmental impact per hectare that is one and the other is per kilogram of product because in the end we need to feed the people people want want food need food and they don't want to go to bed hungry so so it's um, we have to produce a total amount of food. How much depends on our diet, apart from the number of people. But to produce that amount of food, I think um, then the emissions per kilogram of product become very important. 
next to the emissions per hectare. So, so um, considering both, I, I feel is um, is critical. Now, um, measuring environmental impact or sustainability, uh, etc. Um, sometimes you can directly monitor um, an indicator at, at fields or perhaps at landscape level. But sometimes this is very difficult and very costly. Um, I mean, George has, has uh, introduced a topic which is almost impossible to measure because the, the soil life is so rich and, and we, we lack so much knowledge that how to characterize the quality of, of soil life. Um, so sometimes um, just, just monitoring measures crop management aspects is perhaps the best thing we can do. And maintaining a certain level of soil organic matter in one way or the other is, is perhaps in many cases a good enough indicator um, to be sure that, that certain qualities of the soil are served. Um, so, and, and, and um, the other thing is maybe on nutrient emissions. It's very hard to, to measure everywhere the um, the local emissions of nutrients but if we adhere certain management practices or standards then we can be pretty sure that these um, emissions are are served if not at the field then at the landscape level very nice i'll make a question from the audience uh, only one because you have a uh, our time is just running out so uh gabriel silva pires George, it's for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, years ago, I had seen a lecture for, from Embrapa Cerrados, an institution in Brazil. Yeah, so you can see it on the, on the screen now. Uh, that they measure soil biological health by measuring amount of two enzymes, which is the benefits from our, from our approach. So I know, I know well what Gabriel is talking about. In fact, I know the person well. It's Yeda. Uh, uh, she has done a wonderful work on, on trying to understand soil health from the perspective of activity. At the end, soils are alive because something is going on there because they're active. And so she decided to go towards the, the, the uh, measuring enzyme. And it's an easy way for us to do this. We have done the same here. And in fact, uh, when we measure uh, beta-glucosidase, one of the enzymes that, that she has measured as well, we are able to identify the genes they were related to the uh, uh, activity of the beta glucosidase. So it's it's a it's a great approach. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be able later on to. Uh, uh, I'm very optimistic that we're going to be able at the end to uh, use some kind of metrics. Could be an enzyme that the uh, farmer will take to the field and then measure right there what's the activity of the organism uh, in a certain. Uh, uh, during the crop uh, growth. So I don't know if this is going to happen, but that's the way I would like to think about it. Uh, it's perfect. That's the feeling we have here. It's a methodology that's growing a lot in Brazil. So people are using it a lot to try to measure soil quality. So my colleagues, I think it's time to give you the words to, so we can give your final words in our event. I think you did the best possible in uh, the time you had for the discussion. It's a broad theme. Of course, we could spend like hours here discussing different points, but I think we did a good job. Uh, so I will start with, uh, I'll follow the, the, the order of the presentation. We start with Dr. Martin for the final words, then Lixin, George, and then I close the section. I was going to suggest to take the reversed order this time uh, because uh, I don't need to be the first. <laughs> we can do that if you want, no problem. Yeah, please yeah? do. Please okay, do. George, then we start. Well, I don't have much to say. I think I, 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 I'm very pleased that we have started this discussion. I think there's an opportunity for us there as a group of the uh, A5 Alliance to start making an important, important uh, 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 efforts into conservation, sustainability and production and, and, and food, right? Food to, to the world. So uh, that's all I have to say. All right. Thank you. Really That's great. It's, it's really nice discussion. So I would like to say the the systemic thinking or systemic approach is, is very important for the future. 
and also the collaboration between different nature and the collaboration between scientists from different area is should be also very important so this is also the way how the system can work together and make more efficient all right yeah that's all okay well thank you very much to uh, to the colleagues uh, um i think there's no simple solution i mean i presented two concepts regularity diversity it, it i believe it can bring important things and i'll come back to that in a minute uh, on, on measuring soil health, soil quality. I mean, it's complicated. Um, in the Netherlands, we have horticulture, which is usually productive, growing on hydroponics without any soil, without any microbiology, and the plants are thriving. So, um, and, and of course, I know agriculture systems in, in, in soil are, are different, but it's just to say that, that plants don't eat uh, my, um microbes or, or uh, bacteria or fungi or whatever so it's 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 important i think to understand better what is the specific role of microbes in in um, in the sustainability of our system either to release nutrients or to suppress plant uh, pests and diseases etc um coming to circularity and diversity here i think um, it's important to 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 advance the research on what the, these two aspects can bring um, two examples, circularity, how circular can we become? Is it possible to, um, in systems, once they have sufficient phosphorus in the soils to do without any external inputs? In the end, we will have to because phosphorus is a finite resource, which means we have to recycle all the phosphorus from, from cities, from human waste, etc. So I think that will be an enormous challenge. And on diversity, um, I think it's it's very important to understand what a good design of fields and of landscapes of farms and of landscapes can bring in terms of um, pest and disease suppression. So we can do with much less pesticides than we do today. Um, I think this is still early days. Um, we know that certain things are possible with rotations. Um, with um, intercropping, but for instance, strip cropping or pixel farming or other new developments, what what they can bring um, with new machines that perhaps help us with that, robotics. Um, I think that's a whole new area where a lot more research is needed to understand what diversity can bring exactly to do with less um, chemical uh, uh, crop protection. Perfect. Thanks. Very nice. I would like to thank you all of you for the participation. And all my final words, I like just to make uh, to mention, like I think we did, humans did a great job, like making uh, agriculture a feasible activity, exploring areas, using soil. And uh, if you look at the discussion we had today, you are like years in front of the system that you have now. So we are years thinking that if you don't understand the whole scenario, the whole uh, complementarity of the members that make agriculture works from the farmer to the plants to the microbes to the other plants to the animals so we're not going further we have to understand the whole system and that uh, was the main subject that we try to include in our our presentations here I think this is science in, uh, in, in uh, plenitude so it's science how the people think differently create things create opportunities and make the world better that's our mission to do here and I thank you for did our job for today. So thank you very much for the presentations, for the time you had, for George for to wake up very early in the morning. We know that's very early in California and also listening to be late in the night, connected to talk to us. So it's very nice to see that scientists are always ready to, to show what they think. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like to finish our event for today. And just to mention, I have a final word that I have to say, that in behalf of the A5 Star Alliance, we thank you very much for joining the webinar, the audience, and uh, don't miss tomorrow and Thursday, you have two other sections. Tomorrow is going to be related to animal feeding, and uh, the day after is going to be biocontrol of pests and disease. Very nice, very complimentary, and thank you guys. Very, I don't know if I say very good night, very good day, so enjoy your time, it's better. Congratulations with your anniversary. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.